same deal. If you do it over and over and over again, somebody different's going to win every time. You know, Benny decided that he wanted to be in the front, and basically that's the deal. You know, you make a decision and you kind of go for it. And uh, we were lucky enough that uh, Lamani kept his cool, and he stuck with me, and we went around Benny over in turn three and four, and I guess he got second. Then. You talked about that start finish line being had at the end of the trial over here at Talladega. It's different from Daytona. You like it any better now? Well, no, it's not. A, it, it, it confuses you. Yeah. You're used to racing back to the middle of the, the trial over here where the start finish line normally is. That's why you get the finishes you get here. It's so far from the four turn down there to the start finish line that you can be leading and fall away, you know, to finish third or fourth. So it's good for the fans. It's a little uh, <laughs> aggravating for the drivers, but it makes a great show. Uh, I use a little hard stone, a little Arkansas hard stone. And I work on the point of that hook. I just take it and, and work on uh, on all sides of that hook. I get down and, and actually hone it. Before I'll ever tie a hook on my line, I'll hone it with a with the stone like this. And by golly, see, it didn't take very long. Now you can take a look at that hook, and uh, it is sharp. Well, it's important to have a sharp hook because you know in worm fishing, when you insert that hook into that worm. Um, you know, to keep it weedless, you have to bury that hook in the worm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you bury that hook in the worm, just like that, now in order to get it into that bass, when you set the hook, it's got to be very sharp to come through that worm and get into the fish. So to me, before you ever tie a worm hook on, take a sharpening stone and put a good point on it. And you, you say you'll miss less fish with a sharper hook. Oh, absolutely. When, the, when, when you get a bass on a worm and he jumps up a lot of times and throws that worm, and you think, well, I didn't stick him hard enough. The, it was your own fault to start with because you didn't sharpen that hook. How do you come into the game that, that uh, we don't have near as many offensive players as we do defensive players, and, and you split up the offense and you don't have the depth and you don't have the quality that dilutes it down to where uh, I think that we get a game like we had tonight. Defensively, we got a, a lot more depth and a lot more experience. And I think it's one of those things that makes you think. I think it's obvious to me that in every critical situation, you're the one expecting the defense to win. You all the situations, you all the situations where you uh, put the self in. You've got to be able to come up with those third down conversions, whether they be long yards or short yards. And, and uh, we just, you know, we didn't do it enough tonight to, to uh, control the football either side and move it consistently. Uh, it was obvious that, that uh, Holly had a terrible night. I think there were five interceptions in him. Yeah. And uh, one that went for, to, for a touchdown for the other team. And, and Mike Mann. I thought did some good things for the blue team. Probably put together the best drive of the night. And uh, I guess uh, Mike and Clayton Houston were the only two quarterbacks that got the ball in the end zone. And uh, the game was the game the night. They were the third and fourth. 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 They were Buses filled with fundamentalist Christians rolled into the Civic Center parking lot this evening. Inside, supporters of religious freedom were gathering to hear Dr. Lester Roloff of Corpus Christi, Texas, speak about the operation of many church-run schools across the South. Alabama's First Lady Bobby James, State Auditor Betty Frink, and State Senators Don Harrison and Barry Teeth were seated on the platform. Roloff criticized the news media for what he called destructive stories about the schools, and lamented the shrinking enrollment at the Bethesda School for Girls in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Alabama does not have enough money to pay the damage they've done to this home. Amen. There's no way. Amen. They couldn't mint enough money. Amen. They couldn't dig enough gold or uranium, anything else, to pay the damage when 55 little girls left. Broken-hearted parents. Horrible attack that's been made. 
on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Roloff praised Alabama Governor Bob James for his support of legislation removing church-operated schools in Alabama from state regulation. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Civic Center. Justice Department agents are checking allegations that Batchelor may have made at least $250,000 in illegal loans from 1978 to 1981. We've also learned that Union Bank has hired its own investigators, the private detective firm of Kerner and Roy. I've been told that FBI agents are looking for any criminal violations of federal banking regulations, while Kerner and Roy are checking into any situations that may affect Union Bank's recovering any money lost because of the bachelor matter. Federal DA John Bell confirmed the government's investigation, but would not give any details. Spokesman for Kerner and Roy refused any comment on the case. But I was able to learn from reliable sources that investigators have interviewed witnesses who say they got loans but were never required to sign credit applications. Other sources I've talked to say investigators already know that at least 25 people are alleged to have been granted loans after signing blank loan forms. Those loans are now being checked to determine whether they were properly granted. Some customers are also saying they are being charged for loans they never made or that they are being held responsible for more money than they borrowed. Today, we were unable to reach Charles Batchelor for comment. We were also unable to get a comment from Union Bank officials about the Batchelor case. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News reporting. Both the governor and mayor thank the 300 or so retired teachers attending the dedication for their hard work and outstanding contributions to education in Alabama during their careers. Governor James, who says he's pleased to hear that the new association building is completely paid for, secondly, told the retired teachers that they have set a good example. Use this building to drive that example home to the legislature and to the governor and to all of us that need to heed the example you have set. Meanwhile, Mayor Emery Palmer told the teachers that the state owes them a lot for their hard work. This state and people, thousands of people, who learned under you owe you a debt and owe you a gratitude more than thank you. And I hope you do endeavor to use this building to further your legitimate interests. And if I ever have an expanded opportunity to speak on the subject, you can count on my help. Later, the governor and mayor joined together for the official ribbon cutting. The new building will serve as headquarters for the Retired Teachers Association, which boasts a statewide membership of more than 17,000. From downtown Audrey. Montgomery, Dan Black, WSFA -E TV News. And Dr. Joe. that you made about me and I hope that someday when I gain some experience in the legislature we spent uh, the first 15 days of this session playing around with an isolation bill which said that you can't pass anything until the budget bills are passed well ladies and gentlemen I don't have to tell you that everything we do in that capital ties back to either the general fund or the education budget so why rush through and pass it and then go ahead and say we can't do anything else because our hands are tied and the budget has been passed. Second greatest mistake this legislature made was passing a bill for the rich multimillionaire oil companies to give them a 2% discount for evaporation on gas stoves. And the third one is a levelized beer tax which now says that no county or city can lay their local tax for this purpose for any cause because the big beer people came in and sold the legislature on the idea of putting one tax across the board statewide. Let
salary in uh, Toyota, Datsun, and those companies for an executive was $100,000. The head of GM, Ford, customarily make in excess of a million dollars a year. That's and the relative uh, fields on the executive level are comparable from there on down. They've certainly not been covering the state as much as I have, because I hadn't seen them that much. I've seen a few of them in a few meetings, but. Details, accurate data on the sources and use of funds. What is this all about? For all of the tax dollars. And why is that person who's supposed to do that uh, not attracted much interest? It's mainly because the people of the state are not aware that this office does, in fact, have the responsibility for accounting for all of the disbursements and receipts of the state of Alabama. Kay Ivey's most recent job has been here in the House of Representatives, where she served as the first woman rating clerk, a position Ms. Ivey says she doesn't intend to hold now that she's announced her candidacy. Her announcement came at her state headquarters in Montgomery. Surrounded by friends and supporters, she said she wanted to run for state auditor because of what she calls the office's awesome and mostly overlooked responsibilities. The office of auditor is the only constitutional office in the state of Alabama that is charged with maintaining accountability of all taxes, revenues, disbursements, and income in the state of Alabama. The only office. She says her background of nine years in banking, serving in a cabinet-level position with Governor James, assistant director of the Alabama Development Office, and owner of her own industry development business make her amply qualified for auditor. She has already amassed a statewide organization of campaign coordinators and says she intends to win the campaign and provide the Office of Auditor with efficiency, economy, and integrity. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. Everybody likes baby pictures, so let me show you one. Now, be honest with me. Isn't he an absolutely adorable little boy? You don't recognize that youngster? Well, let's put a little age on him. Here he is again as an all-state football player at Sydney Lanier High School. Surely you recognize him now. You're still not sure. Okay, one more time. Here's that precious little boy, now full-grown and a much-decorated Korean War hero. Yep, that's his honor, the mayor of Montgomery, Emory Farmer, a very interesting person. Emory Farmer was born on June 3rd, which, when you think about it, is most appropriate. That's also the birthday of another man who created some political excitement in Montgomery, a man named Jefferson Davis. Farmer was born on that day in 1930. His place of birth was Troy, Alabama. It was not until 1943 that Emory Farmer and the city of Montgomery met for the first time, beginning what has become one of the great love affairs of our time. Emory Farmer does indeed love Montgomery, and it would appear from recent election returns that the feeling is mutual. Farmer was truly an outstanding football player at Lanier. In fact, he signed a scholarship to play at Alabama, but an injury in the first annual high school all-star game ended his football career. He then turned his interest to soldiering. He won all the honors available as an ROTC cadet at Alabama, graduating early so as not to miss out on the excitement going on in Korea. His combat record in Korea would have made John Wayne envious. Two Purple Hearts, the Bronze Star, Silver Star, Croix de Guerre with Palms, an Army career seemed likely when he returned to the States, but peacetime military duty wasn't his cup of tea. He resigned his commission, came back to Montgomery, went to work for Farmer and Flynn, a construction firm in which his brother was a partner. Later, Farmer branched out on his own, specializing in shopping center construction. It made him a millionaire. It was relatively late in life when Farmer entered politics, and it was a tragedy that projected him into that arena. For years, the farmer's youngest son, David, who loved politics, had tried unsuccessfully to get his dad to run for office. David Farmer was killed in an automobile accident in 1975 at the age of 20. Not long thereafter, Emory Farmer entered politics. He was elected to the city council, 
Two years later, when Jim Robinson resigned as mayor, Farmer was elected to that office. He has since been re-elected to a full term. It does no violence to history to say that Montgomery has never had a mayor quite like him with Farmer. As the saying goes, after they made him, they threw away the mole. Farmer is a full-time mayor, like 24 hours a day. If there's a fire in the middle of the night, the trucks have to go all out to get there before Emory. If there's a crime committed in the pre-dawn hours, pistol-packing Emory is liable to make the arrest. In between, he cuts all the necessary ribbons, makes the right speeches at the right places, and runs city government in a tight-fisted, take-no-lips-from-anybody fashion. Physically, he's hard as a rock, and it's downright disgusting to report that he weighs precisely what he weighed 35 years ago when he played football at Lanier, 185 pounds. That's without his pistol. There's no middle ground on him with Farmer. Folks who like him really like him. Those who don't really don't. But like him or not, you've got to agree that Emory Farmer is a VIP, a very interesting person. We looked in Larry's tackle box to show you the three basic groups of uh, bass baits. Probably the most popular, Larry, wouldn't you say, is the crankbait, which is the one that's uh, most easily fished? Sure. Throw it and crank it. That's uh, simple. Okay. Then uh, here's one of the more popular ones, the uh, spinnerbait, and there are variations on this. And then the one that made Tom Mann famous is the uh, worm, or in this case, the jelly worm. Jelly worm, right. Okay, now you have a spinner bait there, and uh, there's a slight modification. Tell us what the difference is. Sure, Phil. This is a buzz bait. This is the spinner bait that works on top of the water. So many times with a bait like this. That makes it buzz right there. Yes. You know, the fish will come up and actually make a pass at the bait and miss it. So in order to increase the fish catching quality of this bait, we do what we call adding a trailer hook. You have the little hook that we add over the barb of that hook. Now, in order to keep this thing on, we take a little piece of surgical tubing, little plastic surgical tubing. We insert it over the barb, and then that holds that hook in place. Now your short strikers that come in behind the bait, when they miss the first hook, you get them on the second hook. And uh, Show us how that works. Very effective. So we make our cast just past the object, get that bait up on top, and uh, makes an awful lot of commotion on top. Now you see why it's called a buzz bait, because it's actually buzzing on top of the water, and that makes those big bass mad. And oh, I tell you, there is nothing more exciting than to see a bass come up and hit a top water bait like that. That is the exciting part of bass fishing. With the fans hardly settled in their seats, Brian Trotche's partially deflected pass went right to Bob Bourne. Bourne skated around defenseman Dale Hunter and whipped a low drive right through the legs of Nordique goalie Dan Bouchard, and the champion Islanders took a 1-0 lead. The Islanders came out fast in the second period and quickly took advantage of a Nordique mistake. Bobby Nystrom, free in the corner with the puck, passed to John Tonelli in front of the net, who beat Bouchard with a screamer over the left shoulder, and the Isles were in front 2-0. The third period was a tight one until the last few minutes. With just less than five minutes left on the power play, Stefan Pearson passed to Trache, who quickly fed Clark Gillies. Gillies beat Bouchard with a drive just inside the post to make it 3-0. Shortly afterward, Dave Pichette spoiled Billy Smith's shutout with a drive from the point that bounced off Smith's catching glove and went behind him into the net. The Nordiques made it close when Michelle Goulet intercepted a pass, outskated everyone, and beat Smith with a shot from the left side to make it 3-2. But the Isles got an empty net goal almost at the buzzer to earn a 4-2 victory. 
Stan Martin, NBC News. Good morning, I'm Dave Rickey. Governor James is preparing to fly to Louisiana this morning. The governor has been invited to speak to a New Orleans Civic Club about the way Alabama handled its recent oil windfall money. A similar windfall occurred in Louisiana several years ago. From New Orleans, the governor and his party will fly on to Washington, where meetings are scheduled tomorrow between James and Alabama's congressional delegation. The topic will be anticipated effects of Reaganomics on Alabama. State Representative Richard Gregg of Huntsville has been charged with driving under the influence of alcohol. Madison County authorities say they arrested Gregg Monday night and took him to the county jail, where he was then released on $300 bond. And meanwhile, a drunk driving charges against State Senator Doug Cook have been dropped. A Clanton judge dropped those charges after Cook's attorneys filed a motion asking for legislative immunity for Cook. Alabama law states legislators are basically exempt from civil and criminal charges when traveling on legislative business. Senator Cook said he was on the way to the state capitol last March when he was arrested for driving on the wrong side of Interstate 65 near Clanton. Alabama prison officials say the state's inmate population soared to record numbers in recent months despite a federal court order to ease overcrowding. Prison spokesman Ron Tate says almost 8,000 inmates were being held in state, local, and federal officials. Uh, excuse me, federal facilities. That compares to 6,769 inmates in June of last year. State Medicaid and Pensions and Security Director Faye Baggiano has proposed that the state of Alabama buy the Louder Complex in Montgomery to house the Medicaid agency. The buildings, about three miles south of the capital, are being sold for $1.4 million. The state, now, the state Medicaid agency now leases property in Executive Park and Baggiano says it would be much more economical for the state to own its own property. The louder complex consists of one, that one 36,000 square foot building and another with about 12,000 square feet. The Southeast Regional Conference of the AFL-CIO wraps up its three-day convention in Birmingham later on this morning. Yesterday, AFL-CIO President Lane Kirkland said, although he doesn't agree with wage concessions in contract talks, current economic conditions may make them necessary. Kirkland added he thought top company executives should be willing to make the same financial sacrifices their workers are asked to make, especially when their salaries are compared to those of their foreign counterparts. Salary in uh, Toyota, Datsun, and those companies for an executive is $100,000. The head of GM, Ford, customarily make in excess of a million dollars a year. AFL-CIO President Lane Kirkland talking yesterday in Birmingham. We'll be back with weather in a moment. Taking a look at some early morning temperatures around the state, we have Birmingham with 53 degrees, Huntsville, Decatur, 56, Mobile, 60, and Montgomery, 59 degrees. Turning to the forecast, sunny and warm today and fair tonight, partly cloudy and warm on Thursday. Light southeast winds today and tonight. The high temperature today in the mid-80s, the low tonight in the upper 50s, and the high Thursday in the mid-80s. And that's the news and weather for this morning. I'm Dave Rickey. Have a nice day. Good morning. I'm Dave Rickey. This is a TV 12 News Update. A Montgomery man has died of gunshot wounds. He received in an argument with another man last night. Police say 25-year-old Melvin Delbridge died shortly before 5 o'clock this morning after being shot in the stomach. Police are holding the man Delbridge was arguing with, but so far no charges have been filed. Police say the men were arguing over money. Another capital murder retrial gets underway in Montgomery Circuit Court this morning. Terry Ringstaff has been charged in the June 1980 murder of 77-year-old Mary Henderson of Montgomery. Ringstaff was sentenced to die in the electric chair after being found guilty in his first trial. But the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Alabama's death penalty law, and Ringstaff must now be retried. A second man, Willie Phillips, also faces charges in the Henderson murder. His trial date has not been set. Sentencing is scheduled this morning for the brother of Houston County Sheriff A.B. Clark. Charles Clark was convicted this past winter for assaulting a newspaper reporter. Shortly after Sheriff Clark was indicted for using his office for personal gain, Clark was later cleared of those charges. And Governor James leaves in a little more than an hour for a two-day trip outside the state. James will speak today at noon to the New Orleans Rotary Club. The governor was asked to speak to the group about the handling of Alabama's oil and gas windfall money. 
Afterwards, the governor will fly on to Washington for a day of meetings tomorrow with Alabama's congressional delegation on the impact Reaganomics will have on the state. Turning to weather, in Birmingham it's 60, in Huntsville it's 60, in Mobile it's 68, and in Montgomery it's 63. TV 12 color weather radar is clear at this hour. On to the forecast, sunny and warm today, fair tonight. Partly cloudy and warm on Thursday, the high today in the mid-80s, the low tonight in the upper 50s, and the high Thursday in the mid-80s. That's TV 12 News Update. More news today at noon. Give her a... $56 billion in budget cuts are proposed by the Reagan administration for 1983. 37% of those cuts will come from low-income housing programs. And that has the National Low-Income Housing Coalition worried. Ms. Crawford has been a lobbyist and organizer for the coalition for the past four years. She says the Reagan proposals will cut $23 billion from low-income housing. She says that's by far the largest cut from any activity of the federal government. I used to say last year I thought we'd just seen the tip of the iceberg. Um, that turned out to be very true, and the iceberg was bigger than I frankly had thought. Ms. Crawford uh, says those cuts would I'd result like in sharp rent increases for three million and I talk families about this living in low-income housing. These proposals are really extremely radical. Um, they're very, very different than the way we have run business since the Depression. Many of you are probably familiar with the number of people that lost their homes during the Depression because they had very short-term mortgages all of their most utility of bills. five years. The government used to pay part of the bills. And under the Reagan plan, food stamps would be counted as income. Ms. Crawford says if those cuts go into effect, it will mean the end of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Farmers Home Administration. However, Ms. Crawford did hold out hope for the programs, indicating that if low-income housing supporters can be heard above the powerful voice of the construction industry, some or all of the programs now in jeopardy may be saved. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. expressing to each of you some 23 of you probably the smallest group that we've ever had retired mr henry lewis retiring from <laughs> mrs mrs quintello smith harrison elmer Mrs. Beverly C. Wallace Chisholm. State Finance Department personnel have been going over the latest revenue figures for the Education Fund and the General Fund. Assistant State Finance Director Ray Wells says the numbers show the Education Trust Fund growing at a rate of over 6% and the General Fund at about 2.5%, both slightly ahead of what was expected. Wells says conservative budgeting is paying off. Everybody's looking at uh, uh, revenue projections uh, much 
more closely than they ever have before. Uh, everybody is attempting to take a very conservative approach uh, to revenue projections. Uh, after the 78 session where we got into uh, the proration, it took us three years to work our way out uh, in the trust fund. Uh, nobody wants to go back into that situation, so they're very carefully examining revenues to make sure that we stay within uh, uh, what can be reasonably expected and not get on the high side of things. The only significant decrease in tax revenue is from oil and gas production, and Wells says the recent oil glut can be blamed on the lower production. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. Prattville Fire Department officials say three-year-old Joe Smith and two-year-old Katrina Smith died in the blaze. Their mother, Kimberly Smith, and another child, five-year-old James Smith, are reported in critical condition after being flown by helicopter to the University of Alabama Birmingham Burn Center. A Prattville fire medic, Doug Sloan, on his way to work, saw the blaze and pulled the two survivors out of the burning building before fire units arrived. I stopped to see if anyone was in the house. When they were to enter the front of the house, I went around to the back and found two victims in the back kitchen. It was overcome by smoke. So I carried them out to the yard, and thank goodness the fire department arrived shortly thereafter. Sloan's wife also had a part in the rescue effort. I brought the little boy out, and she administ administered artificial resuscitation to, to him while I went back in the house for the lady. So she played a big role. She kept the little boy alive. The cause of the blaze is still under investigation. The fire deaths were the first reported in the immediate Prattville area since 1978. Mac Carmack, WSFA TV News in Prattville. I stopped to see if anyone was in the house. When they were to enter the front of the house, I went around to the back and found two victims in the back kitchen. It was overcome by smoke. So I carried them out to the yard, and thank goodness the fire department arrived shortly thereafter. Festivities for the Soul Timers baseball game begins tomorrow afternoon at 4.30 with a parade at Eastdale Mall. The program at Patterson Field will then begin at 6. Several of the Old Timers will be on hand for a pitching and batting clinic before the game, and the Troy State University Band will also give a 45-minute concert. Game time is approximately 8 o'clock. Now, two of the Old Timers on hand for tomorrow night's game will be former Detroit pitching great Virgil Trucks and New York Yankees fireballer Eddie Slugger Wells. Both told me they are excited about tomorrow's gathering of old-time baseball talent. Well, as you know, Slugger here, Wells on my right, and of course, Ben Chapman, Norm Zouchin. Uh, these are old timers that I'm talking about, and several others that uh, I don't know locally, but those in Pig House, uh, who was a catcher with Detroit, uh, is coming down from Birmingham. So we should have uh, probably in the neighborhood of 10, 12, 15 old time ballplayers who played Major League Baseball. 
Slugger, understand you're going to get out there and play, huh? I'm going to get out there and play. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. I'm 81 years of age. I'm going to be one of the managers. One of the managers. Ernest O'Connor and myself and Tom Oliver. We're going to be the managers, and we're going to run the show from our side of it. And, and the famous Virgil Trucks here is going to do some of the pitching. It's going to be a great show out there that night, and uh, we're going to have three bands out there, and Long's band from Troy State will be up here, and other bands here from Lanier and Carver. And we going to have a lot of fun out there that night, and the Shrine's going to put on the show, too, let alone this here old-timers game. It'll be a show right, because it was last year. It'll be a repetition of that. Tickets for tomorrow's old-timers game are $2 for adults and $1 for children. All the proceeds go to benefit the Alcazar Crippled Children's Transportation Fund. Rick Pons, WSFA TV Sports. The Pirate Bats continue to sizzle against Braves pitching. Bottom of the second runner on third, red-hot Jason Thompson rips this two-out single to left off Rick Mailer. That'll score Omar Moreno to make it 1-0 Bucks. Atlanta gets their two in the second off Rick Roden. No outs, runners on second and third. Chris Chambliss grounds to short. But Jimmy Smith's throw to first is wild. Dale Murphy and Bob Horner come in to score, and the Braves lead it 2-1. to one. But the Pirates will tie it in the bottom of the second. Two on, two outs. Moreno gets this hit to left. Murphy will come up throwing, but it's not in time. Jimmy Smith scores, making it two all. The game winner comes in the fourth. Roden proving that pitchers can hit. Lashes this double to right center, scoring Tony Pena from second. That'll make it 3-2 Pirates. The Bucks picked up another in the sixth. They go on to win it 4-2. Pittsburgh has now beaten Atlanta four out of six meetings this year. Rick Pons, WSFA-TV Sports. Larry Colombo is throwing a crankbait right now, and if you'll notice now, this bait is not running exactly straight back to you, is it, Larry? That's right, Phil. It's running a little bit off to the left. What you going to uh, do to... I want to tune this bait or true it up, what we call tuning a crankbait. To get your natural action from a bait, it has to run absolutely straight. That bait was running a little bit to the left. I keep these needle nose pliers handy. You have a very small eye ring here. And if it's running to the left, you want to bend that eye ring slightly to the right, bending it in the opposite direction from which it's running, running off. Left, bend the eye to the right, so looking I, straight at the bait. Yeah, I've bent it a little right now. Now the bait should run, uh, should run true. We ought to get a, a, a true tracking, what we call tracking out of the bait. So I'll make another cast, and we'll check it as it comes in. And uh, I tell you what, it's running, running a little slightly to the right. Now to you the right. Over I over-adjusted it. So, so you'll come back to I'll the left. come back to the left a little bit with it. And uh, sometimes it takes about two adjustments to get one uh, perfectly true, but it's important that that thing track perfectly straight. On one hand, pertussis, or as it is more commonly known, whooping cough. It is a painful, lingering disease. Bouts of pertussis can last 10 weeks and can permanently damage the bronchial tubes, the lungs, and in extreme cases, the brain. It can kill. On the other hand, the vaccine, capable of immunizing children against pertussis most of the time, but itself capable of occasional devastating side effects, high fever, convulsions, and again, in extreme cases, the vaccine is believed by many to cause brain damage. And there is the controversy. On one side, health officials who argue that without the vaccine, incidence of pertussis will again rise, as it has in the past, to epidemic proportions. And on the other side, doctors and scientists around the nation who say the vaccine itself is a greater threat to public health than the now almost unknown pertussis. WRC reported the disease started falling off years ago, long before the pertussis vaccine went into widespread use. No one knows for sure why the decline. State health officials say last year no cases of pertussis were found in Alabama, but the coordinator of the state immunization program, Ed Cavanis, says it's because the vaccine is used that pertussis is rare. We've seen a decrease over the last 10 years, every year in the state, of all immunizable diseases. One thing Still, is we critics have point to other countries where pertussis vaccinations are no longer mandatory because the risk of damage from the vaccine was considered too great. More on what has happened in those countries in our next report. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. England, a country that suspended mandatory pertussis vaccinations in 1977. By 1978, over 100,000 cases of pertussis were reported, with 36 deaths. 
Those are statistics from the Alabama State Health Department, where immunization officials say the increased pertussis incidence was caused by the suspension of the pertussis shots. But vaccine critics say the number of deaths from pertussis in England is still lower than it ever was before the vaccine came into widespread use. WRC Television in Washington, D.C. reports that English health officials recognized the potential hazards of the vaccine, and they considered them greater than the dangers of the disease. That prompted the suspension. It also prompted the British government to start a reimbursement program for children who suffered at least 80% disability, which could be directly linked to the vaccine. So far, almost 600 children have collected. Other countries have also seen a danger in the pertussis vaccine. WRC reported that Sweden stopped mandatory pertussis vaccinations. No epidemic resulted. The same thing happened in West Germany. But in Japan, vaccine use was dropped in the late 70s, and state health officials say a major pertussis outbreak occurred. The number of cases increased 10 times, and an average pertussis death rate of five a year jumped to an average of 32 deaths annually. Still, concern about the vaccine persists. This is not the first time doctors and scientists have questioned the pertussis vaccine. The controversy around the DPT shots dates back to 1936. More on what the United States has done in almost 50 years of complaints and concern about the vaccine in our next report. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. It was back in 1936 that reports first surfaced drawing links between the pertussis vaccine and brain damage. WRC Television in Washington, D.C. reports that since then, numerous medical and scientific journals have reported problems with the vaccine. It was concern in the United States that prompted officials in Great Britain to conduct a study of the vaccine and its side effects, a study that resulted in suspension of mandatory shots in that country. But the United States government didn't get around to a formal study of the possible dangers of the DPT vaccine until 1978, 42 years after first being alerted to the possible dangers. WRC reported the study found one in 13 children react to the shots with high-pitched crying, one in every 700 have convulsions. State health officials say the incidence of convulsions is one in every 7,000. But no research was done to see if any long-term damage can result from the vaccine, because the only official United States government study of the vaccine and its possible dangers ran out of money. State health officials um, say before children so are given DPT shots in Alabama public health benefits, clinics, parents are given an information sheet to read and sign. It lists chances of high fever, convulsions, abnormal prolonged crying, or shock at one in every 7,000 children receiving the shots. It says about once in every 100,000 shots, brain damage may occur, and even more rarely, death. It also warns who should not have the shots. Children who are sick with something more serious than a cold, children with a history of convulsions or nervous disorders, and children who have had serious reactions to the DPT shots before. State health officials agree that the vaccine is not perfect. What's being done to remedy that situation in our next report. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. Okay. 156,000 DPT shots were given to Alabama children last year. Only one reaction was reported. That child recovered within a week. There were no cases of pertussis reported in Alabama last year. So as far as we're concerned at the state, uh, the reaction rate is no greater than other vaccines. I don't feel that it's dangerous myself. Uh, I, if it were dangerous, I'm sure that uh, we would have children that would be ill when you get 100. The coordinator of the state now, immunization program, risk, Ed Cavanaugh, says the idea is to, to the protect, the protect the public from recurrences of pertussis, and, the and sometimes it's and hard to keep people concerned about vaccine. a disease when it's under control. But Cavanaugh admits there are problems with the vaccine. I personally feel that the vaccine we've got is effective. It's just not as good as I think it could be. I'd like to see a vaccine there was no reactions to, not even minor. Still, Kavanaugh says there has been a decrease uh, every year for the past 10 years of all immunizable diseases in Alabama. The information specialist for the immunization program, Francis Kenimer, says there can always be something better. I do not. I think the benefits derived from pertussis vaccine immunization far outweigh the risks of pertussis vaccine immunization. DTP vaccine does commonly result in some slight fever or other slight discomfort for the child. It's always been that way, and it, it's something that can be expected in a um, fair number of cases. 
Kenimer and Kavanis both say children don't have to get any vaccinations if they have written medical excuses or if their religious beliefs are opposed to the shots. Efforts are underway by the Food and Drug Administration and several private companies to develop a new, better vaccine. In Japan, a new vaccine is being used, supposedly a purer form of what's being used in the U.S. It has not been clinically tested and can't be expected to be used in this nation for several years at the earliest. This week, WRC Television in Washington, D.C. reported further findings from their year-long investigation into the pertussis vaccine. Findings drawing at least tentative links between the vaccine and sudden infant death syndrome. This week, the U.S. Senate is holding hearings on the pertussis vaccine. Hearings have been called for in the House of Representatives. In the meantime, the argument over the pertussis vaccine now being used is expected to continue. On one side, pertussis, a disease with the potential for wide-ranging, devastating effects. On the other side, a vaccine, protection from the disease but perhaps with a high price all its own. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News.
in fiber of this great nation. You know, ladies and gentlemen, that agriculture, the American farmer has been too productive. That's the reason why is charged in bringing growth and development of wood products in the next 20 years will have to come from uh, probably to broaden the public relations aspect of the department. I would like to see regional Next academic year, in-state students attending Alabama State will pay $220 per quarter for tuition, up $20. Out-of-state students will pay $440, an increase of $40. Room and board at ASU goes up $30 to $430. School officials say the new tuition fee remains the lowest among all public colleges and universities in Alabama. They say the increase won't affect student financial aid for college-based programs, which suffered a $211,000 cut in federal appropriations. Even with the cut, school officials say they'll still be able to provide financial assistance to about 87% of the students who depend on the aid to pay for their college educations. Also, some board members were concerned that the new tuition will affect student recruiting. ASU President Dr. Robert Randolph was optimistic that it won't. He's been lobbying with alumni throughout the nation, drumming up support for ASU. He says the alumni response and financial backing has been favorable. Also today, the board approved a 6.5% salary increase for the faculty and approved a resolution to tear down Tullabody Hall, the school's first campus building, but not without some compromises. That story tonight at 10. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News from the campus of Alabama State University. ASU officials say Tullabody Hall was the school's first building constructed in 1905. It was named after the birthplace in Scotland of the school's founder and first president, Dr. William Patterson. Historians say the 77-year-old building served as a gymnasium, auditorium, and high school for black students in Montgomery years ago. Several students, some who helped lay the bricks, remember that and say they don't want that historical significance forgotten. One student is Dr. John Garrett Hardy, who reminded trustees of the building's historical value. Hardy says it was a struggle to build and keep the facility going. He and the board know it will be too costly to refurbish the dilapidated building. They say it was during the Levi Watkins administration when word to tear down Tullabody Hall cropped up, and several people, including the local historical society, objected to its demolition project. At today's meeting, the group agreed to a compromise, allowing the building to be torn down, providing a replica be built in a new fine art center soon to be constructed. The center is part of phase two of the building, still called Tullabody. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News from the campus of Alabama State University. The governor, strongly in support of the concept of federalism, took part of his cabinet to Washington to show the Alabama congressional delegation how he thinks it could work in Alabama. The governor said the federal government could cut federal aid to the state by $100 million a year for the next three years, as long as the money that did make its way had few to no strings attached, and the state government could make the spending decisions. Cabinet members Linda Hardick Cedar, Billy Joe Kemp of the Highway Department, Faye Baggiano of the Pensions and Security and Medicaid Department, Glenn Ireland of Mental Health, Henry Cobb of Military, and Mary Louise Sims of Education, each took turns telling the congressmen how they think they could provide more efficient services if they could control the programs. They said the current federal programs were created one at a time over the last decade and a half with no oversight of duplication, unnecessary regulation, and massive administration in mind. It was a cohesive thrust by Governor James to show that Alabama could do more with less. Currently, there is no legislation in Congress on federalism, and there are questions about whether there will be during the balance of this year. And Governor James' request for larger federal cuts and greater state control over those dollars that do come in is only the reaction of one of 50 states. But all of the congressmen at this morning's meeting seemed appreciative of the governor's efforts to show how Alabama would take fewer federal dollars and turn them into more efficient services. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News, reporting from Washington, D.C. In a letter to State Attorney General Charles Grodick, Assistant U.S. Attorney General William Bradford Reynolds says the Justice Department has carefully considered the plan and finds, quote, it clearly would lead to a regression in the position of black voters. The letter went on to cite problems in House districts in Jefferson and Tuscaloosa counties, as well as several other counties in West Alabama. State Senator Lister Hill Proctor of Sylacauga 
chairman of the committee that drew up the plan, says he hopes Governor Bob James will call a legislative session quickly to deal with the revisions in the plan. Senator Proctor says he plans to meet with State Representative Rick Manley of Demopolis in the morning to discuss the Justice Department decision. Manley is the co-chairman of the Legislative Reapportionment Committee. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. At a news conference today at Union Station, Montgomery businessman and Huntington College trustee Jim Wilson Contra, says the train the shed at the old station will be transformed into a banquet and, uh, facility to house the benefit in June. The featured speaker for this year's event will be Bob Hope, known to millions the world over. Hope, who will celebrate his 79th birthday less than a week before his appearance, is perhaps best known for his annual Christmas tours to military bases around the world, which he performed for 22 years. Wilson says a dramatic change will take place at the historic train shed for the $100 per person banquet. A wooden floor is to be installed over the old tracks under the structure to accommodate tables. Wilson says the shed will take on a festive decor with some type of drapes and panels to protect the crowd should the weather fail to cooperate for the event. Bob Hope, a friend of Wilson's, has agreed to speak at the benefit free, so all proceeds will be used to help augment the scholarship fund for Huntington College. Mac Carmack, WSFA TV News. The Justice Department says the reapportionment plan passed by the legislature last year poses a serious danger of discrimination against black voters. Assistant U.S. Attorney General William Bradford Reynolds criticized the legislature for failing to assign 6,700 residents of Montgomery to any legislative district at all and of diluting black voting strength in rural West Alabama and in urban areas. State Senator Lister Hill Proctor, co-chairman of the Legislative Reapportionment Committee, says he and other legislative leaders probably will urge Governor Bob James to call a special session to approve a new set of House and Senate districts. Governor James, arriving in Montgomery this evening, says other states have had problems with their district plans, and they've worked them out. They were able to resolve those problems in a couple of weeks. So, uh, based on that background, with the Justice Department, I think wants to be cooperative, uh, Senator Proctor and uh, Representative Manley, uh, once they've had a chance to study where the problems are, requested I call a special session. Uh, of course, I call a special session. James says if the legislature can come up with a new plan in time, he'll call a special session for reapportionment before he calls one for government reform. The governor learned of the Justice Department action when he returned from a Washington meeting with Alabama's congressional delegation. Chris Grimshaw has more. Of, uh, of this department because it touches every consumer. I think it's a sleeping giant. I think it. I think it has one of the greatest potentials of any department in in government in the state of Alabama. It has it has great uh, potential, and I the the average person does not realize the importance. Uh, of, uh, of this department because it touches every consumer in the state. It comes out of the out of number two, but the we we established a three point <coughs> program and not a band aid cap program that's uh, going to get us by and reduce the quality of education. 